Greetings to everybody again. Uh, my name is Naledi Chirwa um, and immense apologies to everybody for the network um, issue we had in the first session, the live session. Um, I'm going to redo the presentation to you guys so you're able to access it um, because we are doing this book reading thing together. My name is Naledi Chirwa, like I said, and greetings to the Commander-in-Chief of the EFF, Julia Silo Malema, the Deputy President, Floyd Shivambu, officials, commissars, fighters, ground forces, South Africans, Africans in the world at large. Um, I welcome you again officially to the analysis of Angela Davis's Women, Race and Class. Now, obviously, when we think about, or rather when the name Angela Davis comes up, our first point of contact is that this was FBI's most wanted woman at some point. In fact, the first woman to be most wanted by the FBI, um, uh, uh, Angela Davis, is a phenomenal feminist icon for many of us across the world, um, across classes, in fact, uh, in different schools of thought of feminism. Angela Davis is a feminist icon because she embodies the fact that feminism should be lived. It's a lived reality and not just a, a position on paper and I think we appreciate her for the efforts she's made in advancing the struggle of black people and advancing the struggle of black women um, I mean she's formed part of numerous left uh, left organizations like the Black Panther Party um, she's even raised why some of the tensions came up in the Black Panther Party and that they were rooted in the issue of gender um, and the compromised struggle of women in the sense that women would do the work, but the credit, uh, the spokespersons of the organizations or rather the faces of organizations would be men. And that this impounded or rather had a negative effect on the women's struggle and the credits being given to women in their participation um, and in leading the struggle for black people. Um, she's written other books. Uh, besides this one, she's also written women uh politics and culture um she's also written a prisons obsolete because i mean she is a an activist that strives to come against the structure of the prison system in the u.s um we'll touch on it a bit again even in the reading as well because um she, in the movement critical resistance as one of the co-founders they believe that the prison system is inherently anti-black um that's because it was founded on racist um uh, grounding uh, that prisons were made for men, for black men in particular, and black people, not for rehabilitation purposes, but to feed them into a legitimized form of slavery through the law. Um, and, I mean, she gives us many lessons on women leadership and the importance of women leading. And I think it's part of the reasons why we come to appreciate the, the kind of feminism that she affords us. It's Marxist-centered, it's socialist-centered, um, it's, it's, it's cognitive of the class difference and the class struggle and the race struggle as well. Um, I mean, she even founded a study group when she was a teenager. Um, she was born in Alabama. Um, and it was interracial, so it was white children, colors, and black children reading together as a teenager, and the police would come and disrupt those sessions. Um, I mean, she's worked as a professor, as an activist, social activist. Her, her resume, her biography, um, gives us more light into who Angela Davis is, and I also recommend it as a reading that uh, we could do. Um, now, on Women, Race, and Class, I think it's an important book because Angela Davis highlights the experiences of black women as slaves during slavery in particular because there isn't much work done to document the particular and peculiar experiences of black women during slavery because they were women. Um, there's documentation of the black family unit, there's documentation of black people in general um, as slaves, but none, in, not many analyses do justice to documenting and archiving the peculiar experience of black women during slavery. And I mean, she brings a human face uh, to the retelling of the story of black women during slavery. Um, the objectification of black women is also done even in academic spaces. It's done in how we tell the stories and the struggles of black women. We see them as objects where we scrutinize and criticize, but we don't see them as human beings who've been equally participating in the struggle. And Angela Davis just does a wonderful job in laying this out for us. I mean, she creates a framework of sorts um, for what allyship should look like. Um, and she makes... a uh, relationships to the allyship of white women and black people and black women um the suffrage movement and black and the black people's uh, movement for the abolition of slavery um, and she beautifully dispels the myth of black femininity and black masculinity right um which is 
very important because the conventional standards of femininity and masculinity are not ones which were historically inherent in black people's lives or in black culture and tradition and even during slavery those standards were not holding water as the black woman's femininity was different to that of white women and the black masculinity was also different to that of white men um, and she helps us to also repackage the aspirations of movement building for feminist organizations um, and and wakes us up to the struggles existing even in movements and um, that seek to uh, bring a uh, liberty for black people liberty for black women she gives us a very good founding on how this looks like and how this can possibly look like in the future in chapter one the legacy of slavery the new womanhood davis situates the struggle of women during slavery in the 19th century uh, of having been born as slaves and as women now uh, black women were doing the same amount of work and had the same amount of productivity and were expected to produce the same amount of work and production as black men. So black women were never given a privilege of femininity. She highlights this as well. Black women have always been required to produce as much as other races, I mean, as much as black men. Um, the only privilege was afforded to slave children, which were seen as half hands, because obviously they were children. But black women, while they were pregnant, uh, after having given birth, were expected to produce the same amount of work as black men during slavery. So the, the privilege of femininity is not there. And I mean, when, I mean, even in the Moine Hane report on fatherlessness as a cause for many social ills, she mentions this in the report, that white people, supremacists were cognizant of the fact that uh, what they were doing to black family units was structural and would give birth to social ills and in fact were giving birth to social ills um, which still manifest even in today's time and age um, she even speaks about the reproductive system of black women during slavery um, that they were seen as breeders and not particularly uh, mothers black women were not mothers or wives they were seen as breeders who were making more slaves for the slave master so they were seen as a calf you know uh, as as cattle how many children can you make and were forced to make children and babies as as logically possible and as much as possible as can be um, and in chapter two the anti-slavery movement and the birth of women's rights and um, she speaks of the advent of industrialization officially birthed uh how it officially birthed the women's movement. The fact that uh, during slavery, or rather back in that time, the economic hub of manufacturing was in the home, was in the homestead. So women, and in particular white women, were based in the home and were producing or manufacturing primary goods that were used in the home. For example, candles, soaps, clothes were all manufactured within the home. So when industrialization happened, they took away all those productivity, the productivity of white women in the home and put it in mills and in factories. And then white women started fighting back because now they were devalued by the system of industrialization and their labor was diminished into nothingness. Uh, they, were, they, they then fought and then the birth of the women's suffrage movement happened at the time where women were advocating for their place in the economy economic system and in the labor system um, and I mean the irony of this uh, all is that even in the establishment of the factories and the mills and the, and, and the mills it was women who were working there but their compensation and their wages did not reflect the amount of work that they were giving out and those are the different kinds of aspects that the women's movement tried to address even at the time um, industrial capitalism rendered white women useless now, all the while, black women were slaves working as much as uh, uh, black men. And the fight for the end of slavery came into coincidence with the women's movement at the time. Because white women felt they could understand why black people felt repressed and oppressed because of slavery. And I think uh, the danger in the assertion of white women in saying that is that they were equating the inability to produce candles to black women being raped by their husbands. Um, to black men being lashed by their husbands, to black people living under slavery. The humanness of black people um, has always been uh, stripped away from them, even by people who are allies, um, because they would equate a struggle of domesticity to that of oppression 
of, of economic, social, physical, mental oppression to this extent. Um, chapter three in class and race in the early women's rights campaign, uh, we, she comes and tells us about the London Convention in 1840, where the women's vote was a, a recommended by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, who is a very fierce feminist who's known across the world um, for her feminist efforts during the time. Um, and she was advocating that women must have the right to vote. Now, at this conference, there was only one black man who was present, who's Frederick Douglass. Um, and there were no black women. There were just a uh, white woman and white men. And the amazing thing, or rather a telling thing that happened in this conference is that it was actually Frederick Douglass who supported the woman's call to women's right to vote and not white men. So inherently we see the relationship of understanding of the oppression of women and the relationship that has with black men at the time, even historically. Um, uh, black men were more receptive to the women's struggle than white men, even when in regards to do with a white woman's struggle as well. Um, she also sheds light on the Seneca movement, on the Seneca movement, which was launched for to push the suffrage movement or the women's movement or the women's struggle and how it excluded uh, black women and working class white women and immigrant women. So it was a movement for middle class and rich white women who are advocating for their own rights as rich white women and excluding all the other types of women um, in this movement. She sheds light on the racist nature and classist nature even of Elizabeth Stady, Ken, um, Katie Stanton, um, who's lauded for her feminist um, attributes and a feminist and a feminism at the time. Um, Angela Davis sheds light to a very important nuance on why white feminism and why white liberal feminism is dangerous because it is not cognizant of class, it is not cognizant of race and only seeks to strengthen white supremacy. Because if black women are not involved in our quest for uh, emancipation, that means we want to entrench the, the ideals of white supremacy even further. If the, the, the emancipation of black people as a whole are not included in our quest for emancipation, it means we have sabotaged the whole cause in general. And that is what she sheds light on in terms of a white woman in, at the time and white feminists. I mean, even at the Akron Convention Center, where Sojourner Truth, um, if you don't know her, just check her out. She's one of the feminist, black feminist icons. Um, she was the only black woman who was, who was uh, present at the Akron convention um she's the woman who came up with the saying ain't i woman right so now at the time white men were coming up with all kinds of reasons to legitimize to delegitimize women's labor to delegitimize their struggle and their positionality in society and they would use religion um they would use the economic structure that they were developing to devalue women and even say things like i mean the thing that she was responding to one of the men said women need help with everything, even crossing a puddle of mud. And that uh, even Christianity uh, advocates for women being an inferior or rather a subordinate um, position uh, uh, in the society. And so Jenna Truth dispels this myth by saying that even in religion that they are using to delegitimize us, it was God and a woman who was involved in making Jesus Christ and there was no man. Um, and she also speaks about her as a person. She even shows um, muscle when she's making a speech. And at this, white women were very uh, moved because they had never seen somebody with that much vigor speak with so much conviction for a struggle they believed in, um, which was for women at the time. Um, she also, Angela Davis also highlights the acceptance of the capitalist economic system by white women because it, it by white feminists, because it benefited them as well. The fact that there was, Black domestic help in their homes was of some kind of benefit for the middle class white women. Um, and they were accepting of the structure as well when it comes to do with the race. So when it comes to do with their positionality and what they demand, then it is problematic. But when it comes to do with the race, then it is a, it is more acceptable. And also she also speaks about how men used to disrupt women's gathering. So the disruption of feminist uh, movements, the disruption or the bullying of feminists is not a new phenomenon. It has always been there. And it's a culture that came with white supremacists and white men who knew that if the women's suffrage movement could gain momentum, then their own privilege will be brought into question. The status quo will be changed and they will no longer be at the top of their hierarchy. 
um and so now the the most thing the most logical thing to do to retain a privilege is to disrupt those who want to disrupt the privilege um so even when black men opt to disrupt feminist movements or to speak down on feminism they must be cognizant of the fact that uh, it is a white supremacist ideal um it is a white supremacist mode of operating of creating and sustaining hierarchies um which only stands to benefit white men um and in chapter four she speaks of racism in the women's suffrage movement right um she mentions elizabeth Cady stanton and her apologist nature in regards to white women's uh, feminism and how it excludes black women um and how they were determined to delay black liberty in the sense that when the when the conversation for the right to vote for black men was brought up or elizabeth Cady stanton felt it was a an illogical way of going about it because it would mean that black men must have the vote before them um and that their advocation did not include their subordination to black people so they did not even have a problem much of a problem subordinating themselves to white men but it would be worse i mean they had a problem subordinating to white men but it would be worse if they had to be subordinate to black men as well just by virtue of the vote, excuse me. Um, and Stanton felt that black liberation would give the black men more rights than white women, right? Uh, by prioritizing the liberation of black people, many white feminists at the time felt that this would compromise um, their quest for equality. So they wanted to be equal to white men, not black people. Um, and white women at the time even used to go as far as claiming that they are suffering in the home was worse than slavery itself and i think we spoke about this earlier on that it just shows the level of not acknowledging the humanness of black people to such an extent where you feel somebody not having the right of reproduction not having the right of existence not having the right of being is equivalent to you ironing or to you being domesticated even though domestication being sexualized um is a great burden but to equate it to slavery also show the different kinds and undertones of racism that white feminists had at the time, even when they pledged support for the abolition um, movement. In chapter five, the meaning of emancipation, according to black women, Angela Davis brings us to the revelation that quarter of a century after the abolition of the slaver, of slavery, um, black women were still universally oppressed. And this came in in different ways, right? So economic opportunities were not viable or, ex or, or open to black women. And secondly, they were also exposed to sexual exploitation by white men, which persisted from slavery. Even, even after the abolition of slavery, black women were still exposed to the vicious nature of sexual abuse founded on racism and founded of putting black women in her place um, to take away and strip her of dignity and humanity and also in indirectly to de emasculate black men um sexual abusers uh, sexual abuse by white employers was rampant at the time um it even gave rise to the assertions that black women promiscuous and this is even an assertion that still finds ground even today um where people feel that a person who's accepted who has traded her body for a job is promiscuous without having to question um why a man in power would offer a job uh, in 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 trading of sex it is exploitation and abuse of power that is historically rooted in white men exploiting um black women um and she also speaks about how white women used to associate domestic work to black women to even say that uh, one of the women in the book that she quotes says that um that she only hires black domestic help because black women look like servants um, and this is a white feminist who's making this assertion to assert that black women uh, should be in constant and permanent servitude to whiteness because it benefits them it also highlights also again the classist and racist undertones of white feminism and white liberal feminism in chapter six she speaks about education and liberation the black woman's perspective now as the women's suffrage and the abolition uh, movement were growing and coincidentally working together, um, white women who were traditionally teachers at the time uh, were providing allyship in the form of teaching black people. 
Now, education access for black people was pro prohibited by the law at the time. So black people by law were not allowed to be uh, uh, to access education. But white women provided allyship in the sense that they would teach uh, women, they would teach black people and black children together with black women and ensure that black people are literate, right? And I mean, there's women like Prudence uh, Crandall and Margaret Douglas who even established schools for black people um, and for black children as well to teach them. And they got under fire a lot from white communities who would even threaten their lives and put them in jail and burn their schools and burn their homes. Um, but that is the kind of allyship that I think even as a person who advocates for interracial allyship that Angela Davis strives for, the, the kind of allyship that is able to compromise one's privilege and one's social standing for the benefit of those who are at the bottom. Um, uh, and in chapter seven on the women's suffrage and the turn of the century, the rising influence of racism, um, she highlights oh, Susan B. Anthony, who's also one of the prominent feminist, white feminist leaders at the time in the suffrage movements, and how both Susan B. Anthony ended up admitting to sidelining black women um, for political expediency. Um, so what this meant was that the, one of the reasons, besides racism, that white women were able to compromise the black woman's struggle and to sideline black people's struggle was because they wanted numbers um, from white men and support from white men because they occupied the social economic uh, positions of power in the society and were not willing to compromise their struggle for their own emancipation as white women um, in order for black women and, 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 and black people as a whole because it would compromise their relations to white men. And she also speaks about... Uh, uh, how feminism then became a struggle for numbers, uh, a tool that is used to just increase the political voice of parties, of movements, and not necessarily to erase the oppression that women face. And I think it's an important point because um, even Dubois warns against, a, you know, using women's struggles just for the, for the purpose of increasing numbers. Dubois says that, the inclusion of women into our political system is not a favor. In fact, women have much more to offer because when you deal with the situations of those at the bottom, then you automatically solve the situations of those even uh, at a higher standing in the, in the hierarchy of oppression. Um, so abolition of slavery in 1863 happens and the support of the North of the movement of, uh, of the abolition of slavery is also rooted in capitalist interests. So the North was not supporting the abolition of slavery because they felt that the oppression of black people was a problem, but because they were willing, they saw how it would increase their capacity and labor force in the North and thus strengthen their capitalist aspirations in the North. Um, in chapter eight, she speaks on black women and the club movement. Now, Josephine Peary is one of the women um, who was sort of present in the white woman's um, uh, struggle or white woman's suffrage movement. Um, even at the establishment of club movements of white women, she was a member of one of those movements. And at the General Federation of Women's Club uh, convention in 1900, she was a delegate. Josephine Peter goes to the conference, she gets there, and white women are protesting, saying that they must strip her away of her delegation into the conference right? It's a, an important thing to note because it shows how far white liberal feminists were willing to go in order to subjugate and subordinate black women and even humiliate them for the, for the purpose of political expediency and prioritizing middle class interests. Because it's not just black women who are sidelined, but also middle class and immigrant white women who are sidelined from the feminist movement of, of, of white women at the time. Um, and then she even brings light to how black women's clubs um, were peculiar and unique because they not only sought for the gender struggle, but were also rooted in the struggle of black people as a whole. I mean, the establishment of the first uh, black women's club was made because Ida Wells, um, who was a feminist at the time and who used to research on the lynching of black people, would document and research on lynching of black people. So Ida Wells established an office and she would go around researching the lynching of black people, documenting, archiving, um, and then white supremacists and terrorists at the time came and burnt her office down. Né? And then the birth of the Black Women's Club uh, was made and she became president of the first Black Women's Club at the time. 
Um, and I think it's an important perspective because it highlights that black women's struggle is not just situated in gender, but also situated in class and also situated in, in race as well. Because not only are we women, but we are black women and we are poor women. Um, and in this challenge, she always raises the she also raises the challenges of black women's clubs, right? And the fact that there were elitist and educated women were given um social currency or had social currency and were occupying most of the positions of power in the club movements. And she even makes a compare and a, she even highlights the challenge of women contesting each other to a point of personalizing um contestation and even bringing each other down. I mean. Ida Wells is 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 seen to bring Mary Terrell down was the president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs um by calling for her to be lynched from the movement not uh, like how white people lynched by but by calling for Mary Terrell to be taken off as the president of the women's movement and I think she confronts us with the kind of nuances we are faced with as women and I mean it makes sense I mean to be alienated from all kinds of participation socially economically politically and now you have a movement as women and now you have a taste of power and you feel you must keep other women outside and this is still a phenomenon that we even see even in today's day and age where women in power isolate and alienate a uh, younger women or poor women or women who are not conventionally educated as per the conventions um of whiteness um and are alienated from participating, right? Or are kept outside from positions of power, or are kept outside from ascending in corporate and all of that. And then in chapter nine, she speaks about working women, black women and the history of the suffrage movement. Um, she highlights how the class and the gender characterization for the fight of the women's vote intensified at the time. So women were calling for their vote and that we want to be able to vote. Um, and another, another uh, build up that she highlights beautifully in this chapter is how black women were allowed to join um, the Black People's Union in 1869, right? This is a very uh, revolutionary move for black people in particular because it highlights how black uh, struggles have always been seeking to include the gender struggle because the gender struggle is a black struggle. Um, black, black men supported the suffrage movement that was led by women right and they were supporting the suffrage movement more than white men supported white women black men were supporting white women more than their white men are supporting them an example is frederick douglas um the man who even supported elizabeth Cady stanton at the convention in london that the woman must have a vote it was frederick douglas was the only man who supported the call for the woman's right to vote and he was a black man right and i think it's an important it's also she i mean angela davis uh, has a beautiful way of highlighting the different traits of unity that have always been present um, amongst the black people as a whole and how the struggle for women is one that has always been supported by black men as well because they were able to see that the struggle and the emancipation of black women is the emancipation of black people as a whole. Um, in chapter 10, she speaks about communist women. Um, here she just has a, an overview on communist women, what they have done. She mentions Lucy Parsons, Ella Reeve Bloor, um, who was a, one of the few white feminists who were able to denounce racism and call it out whenever it peaked its tiny, ugly face. Um, Anita Whitney, a white woman who also bravely spoke out against lynching as a mode of punishment and consequence for criminals. And she also knew that it was, it was actually a supremacist method of putting black people to subordination and in particular of black men because they were the majority of people who suffered lynching um and then we come to chapter 11 one of my favorite chapters um to be quite honest um on rape racism and the myth of the black rapist um i think it is such an important um chapter because it disposes the myth that the rapist is the black man um and that is because there's a historical context to where the culture and tradition of rape stems from. Um, and there's rooted evidence that rape culture um, was made to sustain white supremacy. Um, rape culture was an economic domination. Rape culture was a political and social uh, uh, domination used to suppress women and emasculate men, like we already said. Um, at the time, uh, 
uh, white men came out now after slavery to frame black men of rapes, right? Now, we are not saying black men did not rape. They did rape, but obviously not more than other races they were raping like other races i mean white men take took the cup at the time of raping because countless and numerous black women who were their domestic help who were their slaves were subjected to sexual abuse since the times of slavery even post slavery right so now to give a black face a black man's face to the crisis of rape was disingenuous and was misleading at most um, and this also gave rise to the culture of protecting um, those who were charged or accused of rape, even by black women. And Angela Davis speaks on this as well. And I think, but she touches on this very, very lightly. But I think we can also make the relationship between why the silencing culture also came up because it was also linked to the fact that now it was used as racism and to lynch black men, not because they raped, but because they were black. White women would even come out and say, no, I was lying about the rape that happened. And black men would still be lynched by the court and the justice system of the time. Um, so now we also root and find the the root causes of the silence culture in, 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 in black women's families and amongst black women on the rape that they face as well. Um, because uh, we understand that rape was used by white men to terrorize black people as a whole and to sustain white supremacy, right? Because now they were taking away the purity of blackness to purify themselves and to purify white femininity as the ultimate form of femininity that the black man envied the white man so much that he was willing to rape her, to pur purify himself. Um, and in chapter 12, she speaks of racism, birth control, and reproductive rights. Now, in this chapter, she speaks about the genesis, the, gen, the genesis of birth control, and how it was also one of the struggles that brought white women and black women together because it was a struggle that was also very interpersonal for black women as well. Black women who didn't have access uh, to to voluntary motherhood. Black women couldn't choose when to be mothers because we already extrapolated in the first chapter that they were seen as breeders, as cows who make children and nothing more and nothing less. Um, and now the trauma of making children for the labor system of slavery was a very traumatic one. So obviously when the, when the question of birth, uh, reproductive rights and voluntary motherhood came up, black women could immediately um, relate and could advocate for it even further than white women. Um, contraceptive rights and abortion rights came and they were across and they were relevant across races across class especially for black women and poor uh, migrant white women and immigrant um, uh, white women and the working class white women as well um, the black woman's relationship to abortion was not only an economic issue um, but also inclusive other reasons and limits and aspirations and 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 limitations to the choice of motherhood that they've always not had, even historically. Um, I mean, even one of the doctors, she, he, she quotes one of the doctors, um, but doesn't mention his name, on how they traced that abortion was happening in, during slavery, that black women would have a lot of miscarriages. And some even thought maybe it's because of the the burden of the production and the, la and the slavery system of labor. But the doctor even said that uh, there was a relationship to how black women, uh, he felt there was a relationship to inducing early labor by black women from as far off as slavery. So even when abortion rights came up, black women also uh, spearheaded that um, that campaign and that movement for uh, with vigor because they they know the struggle of not being able to have access or the power to have uh, to choose on voluntary motherhood. And then there was also forced sterilization of black women that came up during this period. So now white men uh, who were in political and economic power at the time still are uh, found the birth uh, rights movement and then turned it around to suit their white supremacist ideals. In this period, they used to sterilize black women by force, right? With the uh, intention 
to depopulate black people and to control the population of black people and to eventually um, sustain white supremacy because if white people were the supreme in number, then they were able to, to entrench white supremacy much easier than when they are confronted with a large growing population of black people. Um, and I mean, even in this conversation of birth control and reproductive health rights, Angela Davis highlights the issue of classism that is present even in women's and feminist um, assertions that, you know, no children or less children equals uh, economic freedom. She dispels this myth and says that uh, not having a child does not create jobs, um, which is an important assertion because it reminds us to go back and not depart from the from the root and the foundation of our suffering and our oppression, which is capitalism. Um, when women le have less children, it doesn't mean that their economic emancipation is hurried up or that it is won. In fact, it is a classist assertion that aims to lock poor people into a, you know, a humiliating mode of existence where we are not allowed to have children because we are poor. The problem is not us having children. The problem is poverty. The problem is capitalism. The problem is exploitation of the working class. And we must not depart from that in order to suffice the means of saying a voluntary motherhood must now be supreme over a, or rather be taken over by classist and elitist uh, assertions. In the last chapter, the approaching obsolescence, obsolescence of housework, a working class perspective, she discusses housework and domestic work, right? Um, what we currently know as what your girlfriend should do, what your mother should do, what your sister should do. Um, she confronts the fact that domestic work should be desexualized, which is an important aspect really that Angela Davis raises because the sexualization of domestic work is a trait of white supremacy. Um, it is white supremacists who ensured that uh, the domesticity is reduced to the work of women. So in fact, pushing for the domestication of, of black women, even in black families, is, is in fact a, a white supremacist ideal. It's just perpetuating racism of which black women are on the receiving end. And we must dispel all forms and all shapes of racism. Um, she speaks about how... Uh, even in the assertion that <laughs> that domesticity should be desexualized, there's even a classist level to it. Because poor people, working black women, working black men, do not have the time to perform domestic duties. And that is where the conversation of compensating domesticity or domestic work comes into play. That domesticity, as much as it was industrialized back then, the industrialization of domesticity should continue and the domestic work should be open up to industrialization and open up to the working class as a mode of work um, that people can be compensated from. And obviously she brings in the state and the capitalists because she asserts that women being domesticated, the primary beneficiaries are capitalists and employers because women iron and they clothe and they bathe children and they give birth to children and they raise them and then the children grow to go and work for the capitalists to make them profit so they become the beneficiaries the ultimate beneficiaries of black women of women being domesticated in the home and thus must also compensate women um, for the work that they do and the labor that they do in the home if the women are at the home and doing work in the home um she also makes mention of the migrant labor system in South Africa and how peculiar it is in the sense that uh, uh, black men were isolated and taken away from their families, which gave birth to the high rate of fatherlessness in South Africa and the normalization of fatherlessness. Um, where Black men were taken into the cities and given not even enough money to send back home or to even survive themselves. But the system of migration is even inter, in, intricately woven, even in urban areas um, or semi-urban areas. Like people, if you are in a township and you work in a, in a town, then you must move to Johannesburg and leave your family behind. And now even black women are even integrated into the system of leaving their children to not be raised um, by them, even black men and so on and so forth. Um, so that covers the whole book. And um, now we come into the last part of the uh, reading and the analysis 
um and this part i want to speak about how feminist victories benefit all of us regardless of gender regardless of class feminist victories are a strength for all of us as a people the fact that there's a daycare center there's early childhood development is a feminist victory because it is feminists who are saying that there must be an establishment of daycare centers because women must also go into and form part of the labor force and not be domesticated. And that happened. And that is a victory that we all benefit from. Um, birth control and contraceptives, these are feminist victories that we all benefit from, that your sisters benefit from, that your mothers benefit from, that we are able to choose when to become mothers, if we want to become mothers, is a feminist victory. Voluntary motherhood is a feminist victory. Education access, we were able to find the roots of white women and black women working together to teach black people. So even access to education for black people is a feminist um victory that we must all celebrate and acknowledge right um access to abortion is a feminist victory abortion was illegal across the globe and women had to find other means of aborting and inducing early uh, labor which led to miscarriage but now abortion rights and we must work uh, but i'll talk about it in the next one and maternity leave as well when you apply for maternity leave and even paternity leave you must remember that there's a feminist who stood and fought for that to happen um, and now we have maternity leave. So feminist victories uh, benefit all of us. Property rights. Women were not afforded property rights. The right to own a house, to own land, to own property, any form of property was not extended to women. At most black women. I mean, even in Swaziland today, um, like if I married and my husband owns a piece of land and he passes on, um, it is not automatically given to me. It has to be given to an uncle or somebody. And women in Swaziland go to women chiefs to go and fight for them, to ask them to fight for them on their behalf. That's the level of uh, subordination and indignation that black women are faced with. And feminists are fighting for that and they are starting to manifest, right? Um, the fact that we can join political parties and form part of political movements is a feminist victory. If there were no feminist things happening or feminisms happening at the time, we wouldn't be able to enjoy the liberty of being political beings um, that have a voice that can speak out. Um, how does the future of feminist organizing look like? I think at the center should be socialism. You know, the gender struggle is intricately um, woven into the, the class question or the class struggle, right? There is no equality in capitalism. Capitalism cannot give you or me uh, equality capitalism will always find somebody to exploit more than the other capitalism will exploit you because you're not a white man capitalism will exploit you because you're not a white woman because you're not a black man because you're not a black woman because uh, you're a foreigner because you're an immigrant because you're poor because you live in, an, in rural areas because you're from the township because you are not a uh, in, in, integrated with formal education capitalism will always find a reason to exploit and at the receiving end because of capitalism also pushing patriarchy will be black women because capitalism is racist and it is sexist amongst other things um, and that is why even the question to Ramaphosa on what he will do to get rid of gender-based violence and rape the fact that the answer is not premised on changing the economic system alienates us further from how we envision the, the, the liberty and liberation of women and black women in particular because as we know are the poorest collective in the country um and you know yeah so we must also advocate for the emergence of women leadership in all in all spheres and in all spectrums um black women must emerge successful must emerge in leadership as well um, and not just the conventional or rather an elitist view of what women leadership should look like, um, which includes women in urban areas or so, but should also include women um, in rural areas, women with disabilities, women in township areas to, to inhibit and to occupy um, high political offices, to, to occupy high uh, private and corporate offices, right? Uh, and policy making as well should also be extended to different women who suffer different kinds of oppression. And we must be cognizant of intersectionality and how some of us in, in our struggles face a much more stronger or stronghold of oppression than the others. And this doesn't even trivialize our oppression as well. Um, 
and i think we must also move towards centralizing lgbtqia p plus um rights and politics um queers and trans women and uh, must be at the forefront of, of our feminist movement right um also being cognizant of the class difference even in that spectrum as well uh, lesbian women in township areas must rise lesbian women in rural areas must rise um and yeah i think that is some of the ways we can strengthen feminist organizing in the country um, and obviously continuing to feminist whether we are called fake feminists or not but we must continue holding the port um, even when it is inconvenient for us to do that now i'm coming to your questions the first question was on eff and angela davis the relationship between eff and angela davis and i think um it's an important question because you know it 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 reminds us of why we joined the eff even as black women um the advocacy for women's liberation is the 14th complementary pillar of the EFF. So even at founding phase, the EFF has located women, has located black women, has located even queers as well. At founding phase, the EFF uh, denounced sexism to say the EFF is not a political party that will tolerate sexism, right? Uh, our call for land is also interwoven with the gender struggle because we assert that 50% of land must go to women right and insourcing um eff students command insourced workers across the country in universities the primary beneficiaries of insourcing were black women as cleaners and caterers in these universities that is a our relationship of feminism in the EFF. that is the kind of feminism that we have come to see manifest i mean the sanitary tower program which was self-sustenance in many universities and some still are even to date um as a program of the eff students command and even adopted by the eff shows us the feminist um tenets and 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 aspirations of the eff the women's matches that we've had last year alone there were, there were four women's matches across um the country led by women to fight for the uh, justice of women and the reform of law um for the intensification of consequences and punishment for rapists right um, and for the adoption rights of queer women, of lesbian women, of the LGBTQI, um, and rape advocacy in general, the EFF not only attends rape cases, but also pushes for uh, rape uh, cases to be dealt with, which are swept under the, uh, under the carpet. This is at branch level. This is at regional level. This is at provincial level and national level. Um, I mean, the call for equal wage is a feminist assertion and that's what the EFF calls for across genders that women must be paid the same as their male counterparts pay me for the amount of work that I do not uh, according to my gender in fact not even saying not according to my gender because my gender is not inferior um yeah and question two feminism and black consciousness I mean I would refer you guys to Pumla Kola's um, contradictory locations black women in the discourse of the black consciousness movement i think she she challenges and she highlights the contradictions of feminism and black consciousness quite beautifully um and places um the personality of women in relation to black consciousness um and the contradictions of black consciousness but according to me i mean really um even steve biko says we don't want to be reminded as indigenous people that it is we who are poor and exploited in the land of our birth this extends to black women as well. Black women are black people and black women, like black men, like black children in white schools, suffer the ramifications of aspiring to whiteness because it is the standard of acceptance in society, right? Um, but even when we speak about black on black violence, gender-based violence is included in that conversation because black women are and black the people. the last question we had was when will South African women um, write a book about the socialist movement or socialist feminist movement in South Africa. Um, and I mean, I'll speak to the chairperson, Commissar Veronica Mente, I'll speak to the DSG, Pop Um, I'll speak to the TG, Umpile Maute, and maybe they'll round up a clear resolution for us on this. I mean, it's a very important question because I think um, as a socialist movement, it should be upon us, especially as the women um, in the EFF, to document um, the socialist strides 
of feminists in South Africa. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me. Um, thank you for your time and thank you for allowing us to come back to give you or rather to engage on this book after the technical error we had yesterday. Um, and thank you so much um, once again. Thank you to all the fighters who have been present. Thank you for sharing and liking and commenting. Um, thank you for the questions as well. Um, peace out.